Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Chris Dunn, also known as Christopher Dunn, <laughs> and uh, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce a very good friend and colleague of mine, Stephen Mailer. Now, I'll tell you a little story about how Stephen and I met. He tells it a lot better than I do, but <laughs> he's going to talk a little more about himself and his qualifications and how he actually develops his ideas on uh, the Egyptian story. But my relationship with Stephen uh, probably started unbeknownst to me one evening in 1995 when we both appeared on the same radio show. And it was on Laura Lee. And I had uh, done about a three-hour interview with, with Laura Lee, and Stephen was due to come on, up next. And, of course, I had heard that uh, there was going to be an Egyptologist following me on this show, and I was like, uh, okay, so how do I handle this? Well, I just let it all out. I didn't know, you know, Stephen. Uh, I just knew that he was an Egyptologist. And then uh, later on, uh, a couple of years later, I was invited out to Santa Barbara uh, to do a, a local access cable network television show called The Cutting Edge. And um, <coughs> I, I was contacted by a nice lady by the name of Laura Wingate, and she invited me over to uh, be interviewed uh, and do it like a panel interview. And the uh, other person on the panel, she said, would be an Egyptologist. And his name is Stephen Mailer. And I thought, I didn't know anything about Stephen. I didn't know what kind of Egyptologist it was, what kind of ideas he had. And his, but I knew that, oh, if I was going up against an Egyptologist, then I better have all my ducks in a row, because I had some very, very controversial ideas about the ancient Egyptians. And I had, before that time, published in a, a magazine called Analog Science Fiction Science Fact, uh, an article called Advanced Machining in Ancient Egypt. And I took on the Egyptolo Egyptologist's view of how they were able to cut the, uh, massive blocks of granite with such precision and remarkable skill. And so knowing that there was going to be an Egyptologist on the panel, <laughs> I thought that I would take with me uh, the tools of the Egyptologist trade, not necessarily mine, but the uh, Egyptologist, and no, that was a copper chisel, a piece of granite, and a hammer. <laughs> because I thought that I was going to have to convince this Egyptologist that you just don't use a copper chisel to cut granite. Well, it came to my turn on the, on the panel, and I'm sitting next to Stephen. He's sitting here, I'm sitting here. Cameras are rolling. And, well, Mr. Don, uh, tell us about your article on machining in ancient Egypt. And, and I said, well, first of all, I, th I think what we should do is have a demonstration of Egyptologists' theories on how they were able to cut granite in, in ancient Egypt. And so I pulled up this piece of granite, which actually came from a tombstone, and that was because I wanted to bury the uh, Egyptologist theory. But anyway, I pulled up this piece of granite, and then I had my copper chisel, which was freshly sharpened, work-hardened at the edge, and then a new hammer because they confiscated my original hammer at Indianapolis Airport. I think perhaps they didn't want me to chisel through the door into the cockpit, but <coughs> that, yeah, really, that was before 9-11, too. But, the, uh, but anyway, I had this brand new hammer, and I took the chisel, and I attacked the granite, and, you know, just smack, smack, and I thought, during the course of my, my work, I thought, well, my, maybe I should have provided people with safety glasses or something, but I didn't have to worry about it, because there were no chips flying, I, and I pulled off the, the copper chisel, and there I had a deep indent right in the, right in the chisel point. And, but anyway, it was, it was a great experience for both Stephen and I, as I understood, because uh, obviously after seeing that demonstration, Stephen changed all his views about Egyptology and became New Age. <laughs> 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 and, 
I didn't realize how easy it was to uh, convince an Egyptologist of the errors of their ways, but um, that particular experience was very encouraging to me. And ultimately, Stephen and I have worked together in many places across the planet. We've been to Egypt together. We uh, teach out in the field. Um, Stephen's a wonderful teacher. I just sit there. I just stand back and, you know, watch it all as he describes the commission history and things of that nature. And, and then, you know, and I just point to a rock and say, hey, there's a rock. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty far from a rock. <laughs> you want to take over now, David? <laughs> Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so anyway, and I've only just got warmed up. <laughs> but I, I, I feel that the, the shepherd's crook is coming out from behind the curtain, and i got to go now. <laughs> but no, I would uh, uh, please put your hands together for a nice warm welcome for Stephen Mayle. I won't need that as I can project pretty well. <clears throat> Thank you. And it's great to be here. And as Chris said and David said and Mark will say, we just came back from Egypt. And uh, it was a remarkable experience. In fact, I stayed five extra days after the tour to work with my teacher on the second book, which I'll talk with you about. And I'll talk about him too. And so it's still fresh. I still have some sand in my nose right now. And so uh, a lot of information is going to be real fresh. And what I'm going to be doing is actually shifting gears here. This will probably be the last presentation I do that will be named The Land of Osiris because we do have a second book, which is called From Light into Darkness, The Evolution of Religion in Ancient Egypt, which will hopefully be out before the summer through Adventures Unlimited Press, through David, and I'm going to go into that. And so I'm going to move quickly through a preliminary discussion. Uh, I know many of you may have not read my book, not experienced with this, but we're going to move fast but I do have to set a framework, a groundwork, to be able to move on. And uh, I'm not going to talk about myself. If you want to, you can read my book. I've been studying this subject for well over 36 years. It really goes back to when I was about eight, so it's about 51 years of an interest in ancient Egypt. And uh, what I'm presenting is a totally different explanation than you'll ever hear. As Chris described, saying that, and we have a wonderful relationship, Chris and I. We're great friends and colleagues. We're both directors of research of the Great Pyramid of Giza Research Association, which is one word, gizapyramid.com. I recommend you all go to the site. We have a group of international scientists, a wonderful group of people involved. And Chris and I are both directors of research. And uh, I love to work with him. As he said, we've been in Egypt twice together. It's our second conference we just did. And I'm going to be leading the tour again next year, so before I'm finished, Make sure I'll let you know about that. And uh, it's just great. We come from a totally different background, but we're coming to similar conclusions. And uh, when we spoke, when I, we were together in Laughlin, Nevada in 1998 at the International UFO Congress, and I spoke after Chris, and when I came on, I said, well, welcome to Chris Dunn Part 2. And everybody laughed. And it's really similar. Now we're going to do Chris Dunn Part 1A because our work really dovetails. He is not interested in who and when the Great Pyramid was built. He's interested in the how and the why. Well, it's good that I go before him because I will present the who and possibly the when and set a cultural framework for what he's going to talk about, this idea of advanced machining. And how I came to this was through my long research into the field of academic Egyptology and realizing that it didn't sit the bill, the answers weren't, the questions weren't answered by academic Egyptologists. I went into the metaphysical aspect of it. I got involved with the Rosicrucian Order, AMARC, in San Jose, California, where I was a staff research scientist for two years and got into the metaphysical esoteric traditions, but even that didn't fulfill the bill. It actually was in about early 1990 that I discovered a, a book by Murray Hope, which David sells in his bookstore, called Ancient Egypt, The Serious Connection, which he discussed the fact that there may be a living tradition in Egypt today that has a different background of what Egypt was about, and we call it the indigenous tradition. And that book set me on the mark. In 1992, I went to Egypt for the first time. And I met the man who is my teacher. And his name is Abdel Hakim Awiyan. Everybody knows him as Hakim. He's a well-known tour guide. He is retired now, but he has over 50 years' experience in the field as a tour guide. Most people who have been to Egypt say, oh, I know Hakim. He's a great tour guide. 
Well, in the early 1990s, he also revealed himself as an indigenous wisdom keeper, part of an oral tradition. Now, people who know Native American traditions, who studied the Native American tradition, know that the oral tradition, and in part in Asia, is very much a part of these cultures. Well, it's also part of Africa, but no one has ever considered, certainly not Egyptologists, that there is an oral tradition. And Hakim represents that. His tribe, the Awayani tribe, which is called the Ai tribe, everybody's wearing an eye of Horus, an eye of Ra, represents this tribe. They not only kept the history of their own tribe, they kept the history of all tribes. So what we present to you is over 65,000 years of oral tradition. And stating that there was a previous civilization before what is known as dynastic Egypt, before what is known as Egypt to Egyptologists that existed and was very highly advanced, built the pyramids, carved the Sphinx. And that's what we're going to show you. And again, I'm going to purposefully make this brief so we can get into the slides. We have a lot of slides to show. And uh, we probably won't even have time for many questions. Because what I certainly do not want to do is take one minute away from Christopher's wonderful presentation. But since I'm going to be here, we'll be here this evening, tomorrow. And if questions, you can always approach me. But we probably won't have much time because we'll probably go right to the end. But first of all, if we're going to reestablish this idea, we're going to create a whole new discipline, we have to start with the name itself, Egypt. Egypt is the name of the country in North Af northeastern Africa today. That was not the name of the ancient civilization. And this is how it was derived. <clears throat> Egypt is actually a Greek word, or a derivation of a Greek word, which was a contraction called he ge -patos, which became Egyptos, which is where Egypt comes from. Now, this Greek word actually comes from the ancient term het Ka pita. And by the way, Kipidiptos is where the word Koptos comes from, where the word Coptic Christian comes from, and where the town of Koptos was from. But the ancient term was Het Ka Pita. Het means place. Now, Ka is a subject we can go on for hours in a lecture, too. Many people have talked about Ka, written books about Ka, think they know what it means. But it actually, the best way to translate it would be the etheric double or the astral body. Well, we prefer the definition, the physical projection of the spirit, which is the personality, which is what attaches itself to the body, not the physical body, where the, the Egyptians added a T to it, chat or chet, which meant organs of body. So it actually is the personality. But these people believe that the personality is connected to the body. So this is why in the tombs that you see in Egypt, they made offerings to the ka. It's like what you could say in New Age terms, the etheric body or the double. And pata is a whole series, we could give hours of lecture on itself, but so-called one of creator gods, which is not correct, but we'll use that because you're all familiar with that. So, pata. So this meant the place where the physical projection of pata manifested. And it was only one area, one site, which the Greeks called Memphis. The ancient term was Menefer. It was the capital of the ancient dynastic civilization. One area. The ancients called their civilization Kemet. And actually, that's a later derivation. The real term was Kem. And it's even in existence today because the Egyptians, one of their terms, the Arabic term for Egypt is Al-Khem. Does that name sound familiar? Alchemy. That's where alchemy comes from. It's, from the, it's the arts and sciences of ancient Kemet. So Kemet is the word. It meant the black land. Now people will ask you, well, what does that mean? Well, basically, this civilization was always based on a river, a Nile. Now, not the Nile as she is today, as we're going to discuss briefly. Again, in my book is more detail. The ancient civilization I'm talking about had an ancient river, which we call the ur -Nil, which was named by a German researcher named Blankenhorn in the early 20th century, which was where, it's all Western desert today. But this river was huge. It was 100 miles across, thousands of miles long. All of Northern Africa at one time was all lush and green with this great river with tributaries. The desert as it is today is less than 10,000 years old. So this civilization was pre-desert. So it was based on this ancient river, the Nile, the Urniel, which is western desert. And the word means the black land. It's the alluvial, dark, rich soil that the river deposits when she floods. And that was the basis of the civilization. You're going to see a slide I'm going to show you of Egypt. And people are amazed that all this civilization was was a thin strip of green land around the river. And the rest was desert. That's dynastic times. But even so, the ancient people called it the black land, meaning the rich soil deposited by the river where they grew their crops, their civilization. So 
First thing we say is we don't teach Egyptology. Chris introduces me as an Egyptologist. Well, I'm not. I'm a chematologist. And it's a whole new discipline. So to get for you have a framework for what we're going to show you, we also still have to lay a groundwork. And one of the major themes of teaching that my teacher gives to us is the fact of cycles. Now, the main, I, I'm called a paradigm buster, so is David. And it's an honor to follow David in presentation because I consider him not only a friend, my publisher, but perhaps one of the great diffusionist researchers that's ever lived. And his presentation showed that, how he's able to pull things from all areas of the world which he has seen, he has been, to show the similarities. And we are diffusionists, no doubt about it. And uh, in fact, I can't believe anybody could be an isolationist. But one of the major paradigms that I'm willing want to see destroyed completely is this idea of linear evolution. That we've always just gone on a straight line from the primitive to the complex. This is total nonsense. Everything in nature moves in cycles. And that's what indigenous people teach, cycles. And that's what we're presenting to you, cycles. And what we are now is just the end of a cycle. So my teacher has given us what are called the five stages of the sun. And let's do that, because this is a very important teaching that forms the basis of what we're, we're talking about. Now, this is quite a different than you heard before, because we're not talking about sun gods. We're talking about teachings that exist before religion. And this is what my second book is about, From Light into Darkness, where I'm going to make a distinct difference between spirituality and religion, and where I state unequivocally that religion is the business that evolved of spirituality. That's why it's darkness. The first stage is called Kheper which we know is a scarab beetle. Everybody likes Egyptian iconography, has seen the scarab beetle, also known as the driller. Why is it called the driller? Well, the scarab beetle is an unusual little insect because it takes a bowl of dung, animal waste, rolls it up, and then deposits its eggs in the dung. So when the young are born, they immediately have a food supply. So that's why it's called the driller. It's also became a symbol the first stage of the sun is the dawn, when the sun comes up. Because as a great teacher, R.A. Shwala de Lubitsch, who, are, who if you have heard of John Anthony West, is the greatest proponent of this man's teachings, he, he made the statement that the Egyptians, commissions used the known to evoke the unknown. And what they saw with this little beetle is pushing the ball of dung in front of itself daytime. They said, well, it was like bringing the sun disk at dawn pushing the sun, so it became a symbol of dawn. So that's the first stage, the sun at dawn. The <clears throat> second stage is the famous name we all know of the sun, supposedly Ra. But here we're telling you, according to the indigenous traditions, tra teachings, Ra is only one-fifth of this understanding of the sun, not a god by itself, but we'll get to that. Ra means the stubborn, often depicted by a ram. In ancient Egypt, Egypt even though they had donkeys, they considered the ram to be a real stubborn animal. So that's the symbol of Ra. It represents the sun at noon. And I'm also going to return to what this means. Let's get the five stages out first. Third one is called Un, known as the wise. Often depicted as just a mature man standing on a staff. Next stage, Aten which is going to be a big, big uh, aspect in the book I'm writing now. In the book I'm writing now, I'm talking about the last two stages, the stage of Aten and the stage of Amun, which I'll discuss with you. Aten means the wiser. This is like twilight. This is the afternoon sun. Twilight. When the sun is at its peak, and then starts to come down. And the last stage is known as Amun, written many different ways. And this means the hidden. And this is why we'll get to what we're talking about. And that's night. Now, the interesting thing about these teachings is not only do these represent a daily cycle of five stages of the sun, but also represent stages of consciousness in our development, and also time periods in history. So that's how these cycles work. And this is why we're talking about continual cycles. In these man's teachings, there is no beginning and there is no end. They don't believe in a Big Bang theory 
All they do is talk about cycles in between. There's no time, there's no beginning, there's no end. So Hepper represents a time frame that may go back as much as 65,000 years ago. Ra, you know, again, as in a true indigenous teacher, Hakim doesn't deal in exact dates. He's not interested in quantifying like we are in the modern world with our predominance of left brain thinking. He's more interested in quality, quality than quantity. So these are only approximations. Perhaps 65,000 years ago, perhaps 50,000 years ago, perhaps 30,000 years ago, perhaps 20,000 years ago. And Amun, we can be more specific, which is about 5,000 years ago. Now, <clears throat> also stages of consciousness. This is the birth of consciousness, where we are born, reborn, to start to begin the path of consciousness. Ra, why it's called the stubborn, it represents an adolescent stage of consciousness, and we all know, all of your parents, remember when we were teenagers, when we're teenagers, we think we know everything. And we tend to be a little stubborn as far as learning something new. So that's like the teenage, adolescent stages of consciousness. Un is mature consciousness. When we've, we've gained a little wisdom, we've become wise. And Aten represents the height of consciousness. The sun at its full flowering in the afternoon. We're at the full stage of consciousness. We're hard for people to believe, but in a stage of Aten, we're all enlightened. And Amen represents the fall. And every myth, Acharya talked this morning about the, the, the links of all mythologies around the world. Every mythology talks about a fall, a fall from the golden age, a fall from grace. Amun represents that. We're going into darkness, hidden. Everything is night, darkness. And folks, that's where we are now. Here's a different aspect of this teaching. We are in the darkest stage of these five cycles for the last 5,000 years. Even with our, I always like to use the expression John Anthony West uses, and it's a great quote. We think we're so evolved today with our striped toothpaste and our hydrogen bombs. And that dates ourselves because teenagers don't know what striped toothpaste is anymore, going back to the 60s. But we're actually in the lowest stage of consciousness and we're coming out. And the reason for these teachings, the reason we're bringing this out, the reason why this is, he has been given permission to bring these teachings to the West through me and others, I'm not the only one, is that we're coming to a new stage of Hepper now. Just like the Mayan calendar, just like you hear from Native American elders, we just did a great star knowledge conference in Minnesota where we, we presented these teachings to Native Americans and they just ate it up. It was so much in line with their own traditions, their own teachings. We're coming out of this now. And here's another teaching I'd like to give you. Without offending anybody's religious tendencies here, Amen, Amen, Omein in Hebrew, which we all say in Christianity and in Judaism, and in Islam, in its way, at the end of prayers, we are taught to believe means, so let it be done. Thy will be done. So let it be. Well, actually, it means, according to the Commission teachings, so let it be hidden. So let it be in darkness. Think about that. So this forms a framework for what we're going to talk about. And one last thing I have to give you, because it's essential for my presentation and for Christopher's, is another. Five is a key number. And I'm bringing it up in this current book, too. Five is a number that the commissions use over and over, along with the number 42. 42, why? They tell us 42 was the original number of tribes that made up ancient Kemet. And as was discussed this morning, in everybody's presentations here, it's great how we dovetail together, um, Hakim's prejudice, his bias, as an Afrocentrist, is that we all came from Africa, that it all came from Africa. Africa was the beginning of humanity and the civilization. So the 42 tribes we're talking about that made up ancient Kemet were all races, all types of people, including the Caucasian race. We're taught that we Caucasians came from the Caucasus Mountains in, in the steppes of Russia. Well, according to this tradition, the white race came from Africa, too. So we all came from Africa. So this ancient civilization, which was known as the Sesh, S-E-S-H, -S the word for the people, it was 42 tribes. And, and if I had time to show you all this, this continues all through Egyptian iconography. You see, 42 assessors of Osiris. There were 42 steps that every led to every temple. There's 42 this, 42 that. That number comes up and up and So does the number five. So five purs. And pur again meant house. So the first one is key. Per ah, which means the high house. And here's a teaching to blow everything away you've ever learned about Egypt. The word pharaoh. Pharaoh. Every day you can go on and see Zahiwas or somebody on National Geographic talking about the pharaohs, the land of the pharaohs, the pharaoh Ramses, the pharaohs Tutmos. 
everybody using the word wrong, including myself for many years, using the word wrong. Per'ah is where the word pharaoh comes from. In Hebrew, it's per'o. Of course, the Greeks and the, and the Jews later, patriarchal society, looked at the society of ancient Egypt and they saw kings and sons. So they said, oh, per'ah must be the king's house. Well, it's not. The high house is the woman's house. They're talking about a civilization that was a matriarchy, where descent was matrilineal. Descent went from mother to daughter. So I say to you unequivocally, there never was a male pharaoh. Ever. Ever. The woman was the per'ah, who she chose to be her consort, could have the right to be king. But it was her house. The men in Egypt were only residents in their consort's house. Think about that, folks. Think about that, men. And this, I mean, I could go on and on. There's a lot of books on this subject. If you want more information about the matriarchal, there's a lot of people who have written about it. So that's number one. Pharaoh, throw it out. It doesn't mean male king. Second, per ka. We had that word ka again. This is your tomb. Per ka, the house of the physical projection, the personality, which they believe was attached to the body. So that's where the body was laid. Simple enough. That became the tomb. Third, per ba. Some of you may have seen the word ba. Ba has been translated to soul. I prefer the word spirit. The house of the spirit. That's your temple. That's where people would go to raise consciousness, to do chanting, all sorts of different techniques and exercises to raise your level, consciousness to a higher level, to beware of spirit, to beware that you're more than the body. So that was where the temple came from. Third, and most, fourth most important for mine and the next presenter, Pernetter. And netter is a key word here. That's your pyramid. The house of the netter. What does netter mean? Well, good old Champollion, Frenchman who worked 28, 21 years to decipher hieroglyphics, from 1799 to 1821, 22 years actually, thought he was able to translate the symbols of, of Egyptian, what we call hieroglyphs, which is a Greek word. And that's led to the whole field of Egyptology. Well, the fact of the matter is the Greeks couldn't read the symbols correctly. And I, I can go into a lot of detail for that. We, would, we don't have time. So all of Champollion's, Champollion's translations are basically incorrect. All of Egyptology's translations are basically incorrect. So we're netter. They translate as God or goddess. Somebody asked earlier, what about all the gods and goddesses of Egypt? Well, the mere fact is we're looking at two different levels of understanding, which I'm going to discuss in great detail in this second book, that there was an exoteric teaching and an esoteric teaching. The exoteric maybe is talking about gods and goddesses, but the true meaning of netter is not God or goddess. And first one, again, who did this in modern times was R.A. Schwaller de Lubitsch, who was the first one to look at this word and said, wait a minute, this word doesn't mean deity, like we understand. It means an aspect or principle of the divine. Part of the whole, not the whole. So netter is actually where the Greek word nature comes from. Netter, nature. So the house of nature, the house of energy. Pyramid, Greek word pyramidos, fire in the middle. Much closer to the true understanding. Had nothing to do with two. So of course at this point we always stop and say, in its original inception, in its original creation, no one was to be ever buried in a pyramid. Perka is your tomb. This is not tombs. So this throws out 90% of Egyptology right here. They're talking about pyramids and kings being buried in, in pyramids. Nonsense. And Christopher will greatly elaborate on this and show you unequivocally how this was a machine. The Great Pyramid, not a temple. And it fits right in the concept of Pernetta. So we provide the cultural framework for Christopher's work. House of energy, house of nature. And he will go into detail about how. Now, when I first presented this, and this is in my first book, The Land of Osiris, which is still available, and this is it in Russian. If anybody speaks Russian, we have a Russian copy. I can't read a word of it, but we have it from a Ukrainian press in Russian now. I presented these four. When we were on tour together in 1999, Hakim was talking to our group, and he's going, okay, and there's five pers. He went, per ah, per ka, per ba, per netter. And he's going, ah, ah. And then he goes like this when he can't think, ah. Where's the fifth one? And he looks at me. And I said, Papa, you never told me the fifth one. I don't know. Maybe it's the secret one. Well, you're going to see it in the slides. We found it in 1999. And that's the fifth one, because everything comes in fives, which is called per Wur. The house of the wise man, or the teacher, which is where universities came from. So that's the five. So that forms your basis. You now have a working knowledge of chemistry and how different it is than Egyptology. And because of time, 
I'm going to go into the slides, do a lot of talking with the slides coming up, and uh, again, a lot of the preliminary stuff is in the land of Osiris, but we're moving up toward that. We're moving beyond that. Where we're moving now into, and the presentations next year will be called From Light into Darkness, How Religion Evolved. And I make the statement, again, in opposed to academic anthropology, religious studies, all the disciplines that talk about religion, they say we're hardwired for religion. That religion has always been a part of human culture. And I say nonsense. Spirituality is what we're hardwired for, not religion. Religion actually comes from a Latin word, religione, which means to bind together. Religious scholars like to put in the word to bind together back to God. Well, Hakim always says, that's intubating that we no longer work together, that we needed a system to bring us back together. But I'm saying, in the, in the, the time frames that you saw, the age of Aten, over 10,000 years ago, we didn't have any religion. We didn't have any popes, priests, imams, rabbis, or anything like that. But we had spirituality, and everybody had the means to access the divine by themselves without anybody being a guide. And so the second book is going to talk about how religion evolved, how religion became a business, sold the concepts of death. In Hakim's teachings, there is no death. Sold the concept of soul, of God, and an afterlife. And that became religion. And I'll get a little bit more into that because we're going to get slides that are come, going to go there. So, uh, here we are. Look at that. Folks, it's so good. We're right up. So, in this idea, thank you, David, of the land of Osiris, we talked about Kemet. Hakim taught me that there was a, a further definition, a further designation within Kemet that had a series of sites from Dashur in the south to Abu Wash in the north, which includes the famous sites of Giza and Saqqara. All these sites were known for having pyramids, pernetters, and temples, perbaz, that are ancient, over 10,000 years, all connected on a grid line. Again, Christopher will talk about the energy of the Great Pyramid when he's up. These, all these pyramids work together in harmonic grids to form an ancient grid. So, what we have here is the land of Osiris. From Dashur in the south, Saqqara, Abu Sir, Abu Ghraib, Zawayat al Giza, and Abu Ruwash. All these 25 square miles of this concept within the larger framework of Kemet was called Bu Wizard. Bu being the word land. Wizard is the correct term for Osiris. Now you've heard a lot of different people lecture and talk about Osiris and think they know the ancient way of pronouncing it. Again, obviously I have a prejudice working with this man who I've been working with for 12 years now, who I consider to be a walking library of Alexandria, even more than that, and that I accept his teachings pretty much straight forth, that this land, boo, wizard is the correct term, where the word wisdom comes from. So Cyrus represented wisdom. Wisdom. They all had pyramids, they all had temples, and they all connected by underground tunnels. Now, I'm anticipating a question here. What about the Hall of Records under the Sphinx? What about what's under the Giza Plateau? What about J.J. Hertek, who's saying that there's an Atlantean city under the Giza Plateau? Well, that's all possible. But let me tell you, because I've been in the tunnels under the Giza Plateau, how we are taught is those tunnels drilled through limestone bedrock, and Christopher will talk about the engineering aspects of this, straight to limestone bedrock, as much as perhaps 50 miles into what was the desert out here, which was the ancient river, to connect with water, to bring water to these sites. Why? Because water was the source of energy for the pyramids. Water. Now, we know water as the two aspects that Hakim wanted me to concentrate on my research was sound, Christopher will talk about acoustics and water and how they work together. I'm going to talk about how we think pyramids were built, how the stone was cut, how they were lifted and put into position before we're done. So the water was to brought to all these sites and in the tunnels underground Giza, if any of you know what Zahi Was has had to do for the last 20 years, they've had to pump out thousands if not millions of gallons of water to get into these tunnels because that's what they were for, to bring water to these sites. Someone asked me, and in fact I was asked in, the, in a radio, television interview this morning, what does the Ankh mean? I wear a nice Ankh. Everybody likes to wear Ankhs. Well, Ankh means life. Egyptologists tell you it means life. Well, it means more than that. Because the, in all the temples in ancient Egypt, the keys that they would open the doors with were in the shape of an Ankh. Why? Because it also represents water. Because water is the key to life. Next slide. And there he is, Abdel Hakim himself. This is at a site uh, where we don't, unfortunately, we don't take tourists anymore. As things, tours, they compress to where the sites are going to take you. We used to go there. This is at Memphis, which was the capital of dynastic Egypt. He's pointing to Hekka right here. 
where the word Egyptos, Egypt, comes from. And it only represented this one area, this one site, Memphis, Menefer in the ancient language. Next. Now, Per'ah, where does Per'ah come from? And this is at the temple of Hathor Dindara, which was discussed earlier. David showed the wonderful slides of the crypts at Dindara. Well, this is on the roof. Now, this is called a cartouche. You hear Egyptologists always talk about cartouche, French word. It means bag of holding or grocery bag. Well, actually, it's a knot of papyrus where Egyptologists will tell you that a king's name was inscribed. And that's another one that needs to be flushed down the toilet because these people would never have put their common names up on the walls for anybody to see. These were titles. Again, five, where are we going? Back to back, back, back. <laughs> um, five, again, five. Each king of Egypt had five titles, five different titles. So what's in here is usually a family name, and it's usually the woman's name. And here it is, Per-Ah. And it's at the goddess's temple, the female netter, and there she is. This is the glyph of Hatur, the house of Horus, or Hiru, which was not a sun god. Hiru meant the boy, the boy that becomes a man when he becomes enlightened by the woman. And that's a whole other story. But there she is, the original Per'ah, Hatur, and it's meant the female's high house. Had nothing to do with the male king whatsoever. Next. This is a graphic a friend of mine made. This shows what would be temple, Per'ba. The Ba was represented by a stork. Why a stork? Because they saw a bird being able to transcend the physical world to leave the earth. So soul is spirit, could leave the physical plane. So they used a bird as the symbol. Per'ba, Per'netter. Here's his term for pyramid. No matter what Mark Lehner and Zahi was, anyone will tell you this was the correct term for pyramid. Per'netter, the house of the netter, the house of energy. Next. And here it is. This is at Abu Sir on a piece, nice, wonderful piece of granite. Pernetter, that's the sign for netter, like a flag or a pennant. I will go into the second book, the derivation of the term, why it became this flag or pennant, and how these symbols became the Hebrew language, evolved into Hebrew. But this is the house of the netter. This is pyramid, without a doubt. Next. Now here we are at Dashur. We start with the south. Why do we start with the south? Because the maps of the ancient commissions would be opposite the way we are today. The Nile River and all its permutations, including the ancient river in the west, has always flowed from south to north. So to go upriver is to go from south to north. So we start from the south because this would have been, the commission maps would have been reversed. Dashur would have been at the top with Abu Rawash at the bottom. So we started, this is two pyramids at Dashur. This one's known as the Red Pyramid. Why? Because a particular type of limestone has a reddish iron tint to it. So they call it the Red Pyramid. And there's actually two there. We're going to show you the Ben Pyramid. Now, again, I'm not going to go too much into what Egyptologists say because it really is a waste of time. But they say that this was built by a king. He actually had three pyramids built. Now, how are they going to discuss how he was going to have his body divided into thirds, have one belt? They don't go into that. But he had one pyramid. said, no, that's not good enough. Build another pyramid. No, that's not good enough. Build another pyramid. Well, we have a different story. These are houses of nature, houses of energy. Let's go inside. Next. I hope you can see this. It's sort of dark. Um, here's what, again, David showed these wonderful megalithic stones that he was showing all around the world. This is one single block, block of limestone here, weighs at least 100 tons. How they even got it into this position, they can't discuss. And this is the inner walls. This looks very much like the Great Pyramid. Now, again, this is different from what you hear from other people. A lot of o people always say, well, the, re the Great Pyramid is so unique, it's so different than any other pyramid. It's not so. Christopher will discuss the uniqueness of the Great Pyramid. It did have a uniqueness. But all these pyramids we're going to show you were built by the same people around the same time frame for the same purposes. And they show the same type of construction ability, it's the same type of stone used, and the same type of geometry involved. Next. And this is the ceiling. It's poor belt. It's, it's recessed. Why? The Grand Gallery in the, King, in the Great Pyramid is very similar. Well, we say it's for acoustic harmonic resonance. Again, he had me concentrate on sound. Christopher will discuss what a coupled oscillator is and how the Great Pyramid is functioning. But basically, all these pyramids were, work, were working with acoustic resonance, with sound, amplifying sound, and using acoustic energy. And all these pyramids were vibrating to different frequencies to work together as a grid line. And these walls were recessed for that reason. Here's the so-called bent pyramid. Now, Egyptologists will tell you this was a mistake. They started out with this 55-degree angle. They couldn't 
50, 40, 40, 55 degree angle. They couldn't complete it. The architects came to the king and said, we can't go on. It's going to collapse. We have to change it. So they changed it to a 43 degree angle. And this was a mistake. Well, according to our teachings, there was no mistakes. These people didn't make mistakes. This is purposely at two angles for a reason. Christopher even mentioned this to me in 1999 when we were in Egypt together before even knowing that there was another gentleman that said the same thing, and I'll tell you. Uh, Chris said when he looked at this, so, well, that's probably utilizing two different frequencies of sound. Well, he didn't even know that a famous man who he, whose name you all may ring a bell to you named Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message, Canadian gentleman went to Egypt in 1968, 1968, looked at this pyramid and says, well, obviously, this pyramid is producing two different frequencies of sound. And he's right. Now, we're going to return to this pyramid, because this pyramid is part of a theory that we're working on. As you can see, this pyramid still has its casing stones on it, but the sides look like they've been attacked. We'll go back to that. Next. Here it is again from a distance. I don't know if you can see it too clearly, but this shows clearly that there was water here at one time. There, there is silt still available thousands of years after the fact. This all had water going here. All these pyramids were involved with water. And what's interesting here is the ground slopes from west to east, meaning coming from the ancient river, not from the river. The Nile as she is today would be over here. It has nothing to do with this pyramid. The ground slopes from west to east from where the ancient river was in the west, which is all western desert today. Next. And this, interesting, there's another pyramid at this area of Dashur. Just about a mile or so away is this structure, which is called a pyramid, which was built in the 12th dynasty, the Middle Kingdom pyramid, for a king who had a title of Menenhat. And Egyptologists will tell you all these pyramids were built by the same people. But this is built with mud brick. And it's basically collapsed. There's basically nothing there today. Very little limestone was even used. David mentioned this this morning. He made a profound statement. And this is so true when you study ancient Egypt. The further you go back, the more grandiose the architecture is, the more grandiose the, the, the glyphs are and the construction. The more you go forward, the more it seems to get worse. So that's against our linear theory of evolution. If we're going from the primitive to complex in a straight line, as time goes on, we should get better, get more superior. Why did these people not? This pyramid is clearly inferior to what you just saw because it wasn't built by the same people. It wasn't built with the same technology. That's why. And no one was ever found in that, by the way. There's nobody, no intact burial has ever been found in an, Egypt, in a, in an Egyptian pyramid. Now, here we are at Saqqara. Saqqara is a famous site. It's known as a great burial ground. The dynastic period buried people here for thousands and thousands of years. We find tombs upon tombs upon tombs. But we're talking about a time when this wasn't on the west bank of the, of the river, which is usually where the, where the dead are associated, but was on the east. And this was a great healing center where great sound healing was involved. And I'll get into a little more detail about that. But we're taught from Egyptologists that this is the first true pyramid, the step pyramid of Zosher, they call it, as if they even know who a Zosher was. But they say this was the first pyramid and everything else evolved from there. Well, we say this is the earliest one. This is actually the latest one. This is not the, the oldest. This pyramid, I date, we date at 1,300 years earlier than Egyptologists do. They dated around 2,700 B.C. It's actually around 4,000 B.C. The pyramids you saw and the great pyramids you're going to see are well over 10,000 years old. So this is more, and this was not a pernetter. This is a glorified perka. This was a mastaba, which is, means, Arab word means bench, where people were buried and a stone slab was put over so the jackal wouldn't get at the body and destroy the body. It was built one on top of another, top of another, until it looked like a pyramid or it resembled pernetters, pyramids, but it was not. This pyramid was not built to utilize sound, was not built to, to be an energy device. It is just a glorified tomb. And they tell you that this structure dates from the same time period. This is nonsense. If we could take it and show you these structures. This structure is at least 12,000 to 15,000 years old, much older than this. One of the great teachings that Hakim gives to me is that in his ability, as I said, he's Western trained. He's an incredible archaeologist. And in archaeology, you're taught this idea of stratigraphy, that you look at layers, and you can see archaeological layers upon, upon. Hakim's teachings are like peeling away the layer of an onion. He shows you the the Islamic Egyptian layer that's there, the, the Greek layer, the Roman layer, the Jewish layer, the Coptic layer, the dynastic layer, and underneath is ancient Kemet. So what we talk about now is layers of civilization upon civilization upon civilization, and Egyptologists have confused it. They've put these things together where they think they see one coherent system when it's actually civilization upon civilization upon civilization. And I'm now going to show you a series of slides that illustrate that. 
Again, this structure, over 15,000 years. This structure, maybe 4,000 BC, 6,000. Now, here's a wall that was built in dynastic times. Not ancient, but this is just, I mean, I could take you there, folks. Nobody goes here. We all go in here, tourists go here, go here, do this. This is just t five minutes away from this side here, and everything there is exposed for you to see what you're going to see now. But tourists don't go here. They're not allowed to go here. So now he says, move to the left. Next slide. And here we see bedrock, tunnels going through, exposed. The Egyptologists have done the work for us, folks. It's here. Right through the limestone bedrock are tunnels. Move further to the left as we go again. Here's more tunnels, tunnels going down. Remember David showed you these structures that were man-made. Well, this is a tunnel drilled to look like the symbol of pi. Greeks invented pi, they tell us. But we tell you that everything the Greeks learned was from ancient Kemet. So here are more tunnels. And look at this tunnel here. Hakim tells me, go forward, Stephen, take my another picture. So we move closer. Here you see these tunnels again, going straight through limestone bedrock. And Christopher could perhaps address better than I how they possibly could have done this, drilled these tunnels straight through limestone bedrock. But here we go closer, and we go again. Next, and look at this. Now, it's not perfect. Chris has come with his levels to Egypt and has done some measurement and showed this is not exactly a right angle, but look at this. We're going through limestone bedrock, and this tunnel, folks, goes down 300 meters and ends in water. And here we are at the great site of Saqqara where the healing was done. We're going to do this briefly. But what was done here, there's these niches. There's only a few of them extant. We take our tour groups here to experience this. There's only a few of them left. <coughs> only, in fact, two. There were once 28 of them, 14 on each side, where, now I'll show you how this was done. <coughs> there's a platform that's right here. It's a raised platform. I don't have a slide of it. But a patient who had an illness, a problem, would stand on this platform. The person who would go in here was a healer, healess, priest, priestess, would put their head in here, you hear incredible sound vibrations when you put your head in here. The healer would intone a sound frequency, would see an MRI in their mind of the patient, would see all their energy zones, the blood flow, the lymph flow, organ blocks, tissue blocks, would know immediately where the blockage was, where the problem was. A link was made between the healer and the patient, and the healing process began. Because anybody who here is a healer and has done healing knows that no one heals anybody else. No one, no doctor, no healer heals anyone else. All they do is act as a guide to allow the body to heal itself. And that was known in Egypt 10,000 years ago. <coughs> Next. Now, it's that pyramid, again, more recent, not a true predator. This courtyard here, today, all sand was once all alabaster. All the floors and all the temples of Kemet were made of alabaster. Alabaster is, a, is, a, is an Italian word. It actually means African crystal. It's for vibration, for sound, for vibratory effect is why they used crystal. They used water, sound, and crystal to accomplish what we're going to talk about later. Next. <coughs> Here we go. Here's a great blow for diffusionism. And as I said, David, I, and just about everybody here are diffusionists. In 1997, Hakim met me in California before we were to engage in a major expedition to Egypt in 1997 in September, which is a major part of the research of my book. He told me he was going to show me evidence of a Mayan temple in Egypt. And I went, wow. The lights went off, bells and whistles. Here's my 15 minutes of fame. I'm in the history books if I can prove this. So we went south of Saqqara. And again, I just went back there a little over a week ago, so this still exists. And it still can be found, folks. Tourists are not allowed to go here. We had to pull some strings to get in here, but we did. He's, it, we went south of Saqqara, about a half mile, and here I came upon a, a temple of an individual Egyptologist called Maya. Well, Hakim says, again, just like the king's titles in a cartouche, this was not a person's name. It was a title, Maya. Interestingly enough, one of the words in Egyptian Arabic for water today is Maya, as Andrea can tell you, as everybody else who was with me just in Egypt can tell you, when they'd come around to our table and say, what do you want to drink? I'd say, oh, Maya. Oh, yeah, they'd laugh. How? Oh, you know the Egyptian word. It means water. Think about that. Keep that in your mind. It means water. So it wasn't a name. There are many individuals you can point to in Egyptian history who had the title Maya. But here I'm looking at him. Okay, well, I'm looking at this, and I say, okay, well, it looks typically Commission Egyptian. It's a tomb scene. He's got his food for the afterlife. He's got all his protective spells. Next slide. And this is a key one here, which I didn't point out to you, but this is in my book. This is Ascot, another symbol for water. Nefer, which means harmony. 
I have a whole chapter in my book called Askat Nefer, The Harmony of Water, how important water was to these ancient people. So this was a clue to me right away. Well, this was a wise man. If they put this on, on his tomb, it means he was smart. He knew the secrets of water. But still, I see nothing here to go on. Next. And here he is. And I just saw this again. The paint is still there after 3,300 years. Original paint still there. But I'm looking. Is this a Mayan nose? Is this a, a Central American Indian? That's a stretch. So I said to Hakim, I said, well, you know, I know what you're trying to say to me here, but I can't go with this. If I go on a stage at a university in the United States or anywhere in the world, they'll laugh me off the stage. There's nothing here that looks like from an Indian from Central America or Mexico. And he says, well, you know the expression, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. He's living in Kemet, so of course he portrays himself on his tomb as an ancient commission. Well, I was crestfallen. There goes the 15 minutes of fame. There goes the history books, all of that. But... There are at these sites these little men, old men in Galabeas, and they're men because the women stay hidden, because it is an Islamic culture. It's not what it used to be. But the men, they'll come around to you and they'll look at you and say, well, there's something you should see. And everybody has a natural reaction, oh, they just want some bakshish. They just want a handout, you know, and you walk away from them. But sometimes they'll take you to something that you'll be amazed. This little keeper, because I was with Hakim to begin with, didn't speak English. He saw I was perplexed and he came to me like this, come here. We went to this little chapel area that was boarded up. We pulled away the boards, opened up the doors, and next, this is what we saw on the ceiling. Oh my God. That's not Egyptian, folks. It's not Commission. Absolutely so. And I can give you a verification of that. And I got better pictures now. So anybody who's really interested in this, went back a week and a half ago and took more pictures, more close-ups. It's still there. It's not even boarded up anymore. It's open for everybody to see, but they don't allow you to go there because there's excavations being done. But I can take you there, and I can get back there any time because the magic word is Awiyan, the last name of my teacher. You can go anywhere in Egypt. And I... Yes, let me continue, please. Uh, to, to verify this... That's okay, that's okay. I appreciate your enthusiasm. To, instead of going to my archaeologist with this, I took photographs of this, this picture, made an image. Uh, I happen to know Aluna Joy Yashtin, who used to live in Sedona, now lives... Oh, no, she used to live in Mount Shasta. She now lives in Sedona. So you folks may be able to hear some of her presentations. She leads tours of the Mayan sites. She was a student of Mayan daykeeper Hunbat's men. I sent a copy of this photograph to Hunbat's men. He graciously responded within a few months, which mail from Mexico is pretty incredible. But he responded within a few months saying, oh, yes, I recognize this. This is the language of my ancestors. In fact, he claimed he could read some of the symbols, that it's actually dating. It's usually time codes. And... I wish Christopher O'Brien was here because we had a great conversation last night. He recognized this as pre-classic right away, and he says what this is is dates. And, but to follow that up, we even went further. I've come here to Sedona many times to give presentations. Our good friend was at David's bookstore last night, Dr. Chet Snow, who lives here in Sedona. He's put on a series of conferences called Crystal Healing Conferences. Another offshoot, which is a whole another lecture, is I've been involved in research in crystal skulls since 1979. So I give presentations for Chet on crystal skulls. So at his conferences was a lady named Flor de Mayo, who lives in Albuquerque. She's a well-known Mayan priestess and curandera, healer, priestess. She, I showed a, a copy of this photograph to her in 1998. I asked her, could you give me a comment on this? She said, well, this is amazing. I, I can't speak. Can I look at this for a few days? I said, sure. The conference was over. I went back to her and I asked her, can you tell me any impressions you have on this? She couldn't. She said, where is this from? Is this from Mexico? I said, no. She said, is this from Peru? I said, no. This is from Saqqara, Egypt. She said, Egypt? She said, can I have a copy of this to show my teacher? And I said, sure. Her teacher's name is long name. Basically goes by the name of Don Alejandro. He is the elder, recognized wisdom keeper of the Quiche Maya of all of Guatemala. He looked at this and immediately said, oh, yes, this is the language of our ancestors. Without a doubt, this is Mayan. And then he related a story to her from his indigenous oral tradition that according to the Mayans, they originally came from the Pleiades. When they came for the Pleiades, they came to four corners of our Earth. One, of course, Mexico and Central America. Another was Northern Africa, ancient Egypt. And he said those people were called the Nagamaya. I went back to Egypt in 19, October of 1999. She told me this in April of 1999. Went back with a tour with Hakim, told him this. First of all, he was greatly enthused that we had an indigenous confirmation of the find. And then he said, oh, yes, Naga. Naga is from the ancient Commission word Nag, which meant tribe tribe, Maya. Did the word mead in the ancient Commission language the tribe that came from across the water? I put it out to you. There's no doubt, folks, that this is not ancient Egyptian script. Next. This is Abu Sir. We're going to have to move quickly so I can get all these in. 
Abu Sir has another true pyramid. It's kind of in danger, in, in being destroyed, attacked. But here, Egyptologists tell you this is a causeway where they led a procession to bring the king's body. And, well, this is, first of all, sloping downhill. Right here is obviously the remnants of an ancient lake. You still have the reeds today. It only rains here less than four inches a year. But these, these reeds are still going under the sand and finding a source of water, which still exists. This was a lake. This was a causeway where water came from the west, which is behind us, from underneath the pyramid to this lake, without a doubt. Next. Now, here's an example of how they get it wrong, as David sort of said earlier. Here's a pillar of granite, and Christopher will address how fine the work these people did in granite. Perfectly round, perfectly smooth, and here you have glyphs on it. So Egyptologists, like most anthropologists or archaeologists will do, they'll come along and say, well, obviously we can date these, so we'll date the structure to these. But as I've taught Chris in the field, and now he knows it himself and can speak about it with authority himself, that's nonsense. This pillar cannot have been done by the dynastic people. As he'll tell us, as he already told you his little story, they didn't have the tools to do this. This pillar is over 10,000, maybe 20,000 years old. The later dynastic people came along and crudely chiseled these glyphs into it to represent supposedly the title of a king in here. And I just submit to you, because I'll show you further examples, the people who had the technology to do this chiseling could not have done this chiseling, to build this carving. So you cannot date this structure from these symbols. Wrong. And here's some basalt here. Here's how King Standing, which he tells us was the remnants of an ancient dock where boats would come because it was all water to park near the Pernetta to bathe in the energy fields, to make offerings to. So again, you cannot date this structure from the symbols. And it's very important when you're dealing with Termitology as opposed to Egyptology. Next. Here he's on his way to Abu Ghraib. We're going to do Abu Ghraib very quickly. Unfortunately, we, can't, we don't take tourists to Abu Ghraib anymore, but I can get you there if you come with me. Uh, we can't take large groups. It's a restricted area for the reasons we're going to show you. They don't want you to see what's there. <laughs> it's obvious. So he's on his way. But what I submit to you here is, first of all, what you're looking here is thousands of, if not millions of potsherds and pieces of granite and, and limestone. Obviously, there were structures here. Why don't they comment on this? They don't say what's here. Oh, it was a temple to a king. No, it wasn't. What you see here is dunes. You can see silt. You can see that this was a waterway. Water flowed through here at one time. These were huge walls made out of limestone to keep the water enclosed. There were structures here made out of granite. This was part of the ancient Comitian civilization well over 10,000 years ago. Next. Abu Ghraib means father of crow's nests. Why do they say that? There was an obelisk here. And here is the correct symbol for obelisk, no matter what Egyptologists tell you. Ib Ra. Ib is the heart. Ra, second stage of the sun. A heart, a beam of the sun encapsulated in stone is what an obelisk meant. A beliskos in Greek means a barbecue pit that they thought the, the gods, like Zeus, would use these obelisks to barbecue their meat. So that's where the word obelisk comes from. Ibra, Ibra. In the book I'm writing now, we're going to say the word Ibrahim, which him is a masculine ending in Hebrew. Abraham comes from this term, Ibra. And we may be giving you who Abraham really was in this book. Next. Here's why it's called Father of Crow's Nest. The slide's falling off. It's a great sight line. Here you see Abu Sir, you see Tashur in the south. So it's a great sight line on this mound where an obelisk was. Next. Now what you have here is some incredible structures. This is what's known as a hotep. This is the symbol of hotep right here. It's in four, four directions. So obviously the idea of concept of four directions this is something that's not new. In fact, we believe there's nothing new under the sun. This is alabaster. And Christopher will dis discuss this in more detail, how possibly they could have done this in alabaster with wonderful, f uh, we actually see circular tool marks, which I'll show you. But this is an altar, an offering table, not to a king, not to a god. To whom? Well, why Abu Ghraib becomes an interesting topic for us, and this is going to lead to a lot of UX folks and Adventures Unlimited folks, areas of interest, it's how King tells us that this was a landing site at one time. For who? For who? And the site is perhaps hundreds of thousands of years old. For whom? Well, simply I'll tell you that in Hakim's tradition, that is a Native American tradition. We just had a Star Elders Conference. The ancient commissions taught that their ancestors from the stars. Particularly the star system Sirius, but others too. So this was an area where dynastic people came for thousands of years to make offerings not to gods, not to a king, but to their ancestors who came from the stars. Next. 
Here it is in close-up. Now, it's been broken off and, and damaged, but it, once this was finely polished, finely smooth, could not be done with copper chisels or with stone pounders. Again, Chris will address this much more adequately than I. This is lime, this is alabaster, and this is the hotep, the offering table. Next. Now, in the background, we saw these little structures also made out of alabaster with these one, interesting gears on them. What is this? These have been moved. They're not... They're at this site, but they're not in the original position today. They were moved maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, and what we call, without being facetious, an Egyptian minute that was supposed to be on their way to the Cairo Museum, and they still sit there 50, 60 years later. Good, because if they're in the Cairo Museum, they might be in the basement, where you folks couldn't get to see them. I'll talk about the basement before we're done. Next. Here, you can't see it clearly in the slides. We can show it to you in, in the field. You see circular tool marks. You see polish marks. But well, something was polishing the stone with, I believe, ultra-frequency, ultrasonics. Chris can address this better than I again. Something that's vibrating at a very high feed rate to polish these things at a high rate, not by a copper chisel by hand, folks. Next. Here he is, I came looking at this. Again, we say, the Egyptologists, what do they say? Well, a German Egyptologist named Ludwig Borchardt said, um, let me think, what are these used for? Okay, these were sacrificial bowls for animals. And they sacrificed animals here and collected the blood. Why did he say that? Next. Because it has these holes. There. Again, the slide's falling off. It has these holes here, perfectly round, with Christopher can address better than I. Perfectly round with spiral groove marks in it. But Mr. Borchardt, Dr. Borchardt, Professor Borchardt, if this was to gather blood, why should the hole be at the bottom? Well, you think the fluid, you know, every liquid seeks its own level. So if you're trying to gather some type of a solution, wouldn't you have the hole at the bottom where it would run out? Once it's up here and goes past this level, it's useless for gathering any kind of solution. So obviously they're not sacrificial basins for animals. Something else this hole was used for. Next. And here it is again. There's a coin here. The coin shows where the spiral groove marks. Again, the slide does not capture it as well. But perfectly round in this alabaster with spiral groove marks. Chris can address this. And not for, we think something was attached in there. Something was involved. Something was, this was, this was obviously, Hakim speculates, he, it's, again, this is speculation. This is not part of his tradition, but he speculates this could have been sort of part of some landing platform for some type of craft, and the exhaust was to go through here, whatever. That's just speculation. We don't know what the holes were used for, but they certainly were not to gather animal blood. Next. Next. Thank you. And here we are to her, and her is the key operative word. You've heard many different stories of the Sphinx. It's Harem Hakit, it's Horus in the Horizon. It represents the King Kafre making an offering to the sun. Well, according to the indigenous tradition, it's she. Her name is Tefnut. She represents an aspect of the Great Mother, because to the Commissions, the sky was feminine, feminine, female, represented that which created and that which is uncreated, called Nut, N-U-T. When Newt wanted to manifest on the earth, on the planet, she spit on the earth. Tefnut means the spittle of Newt, and it was right here at Giza. And according to this tradition, she is the oldest statue on our planet that we know of now. There may be things older, but that her date is 54,000 years. 54,000 years, not 4,500, like Zahi Awas will tell you, and not he, like Zahi Awas will tell you. That the face has been recarved many times. This is not the original face. But I wrote an article for David's Wex magazine in 1995 where I speculated the face as it is today is that of a black African woman's face. She was the mother of the first king of the first dynasty whose name was Hor Aha or Men Aha. The Greeks called Menes. And to honor his mother, he had the face of the Sphinx recarved to her face. It's not a man's face to any degree. Anybody will take you to Egypt, you look at her, and if you can still tell me you think that's a man's face, well, I mean, that's your, your prerogative. But I can tell you how many people I've taken, given this in the tradition, say, just look at the face. And people, I can't see how anybody can not see it's not a woman's face. And it's a black African face, without a doubt. It's not a Caucasian male face, not by any degree. But it's not the original face. The original face was probably more like a lioness human face. We'll show you a little bit more of that later as another netter will come up. So she, Tefnut, was carved in three stages. First the head and the four. Pause, and this has been verified by the work of Robert Schock and, and, and uh, John Anthony West, who showed that the erosion at the front of the Sphinx is twice as much as the back. Then she was carved in the middle section, and then the tail. So she's carved over thousands and thousands of years. But the original carving, Hakim tells us, 
He just puts a figure, 54,000 years. And he tells us before it was even carved as a statue, this outcropping, which is called in geology a yard dang, was sacred because of the energy there. He always tells us the energy of the site dictates what's there. Why we have pyramids, why we have the Sphinx, is that Giza, in my opinion, may be the number one power place, power place on our planet. She was just an outcropping of limestone. He said people used to come here 56,000 years ago just to energize themselves, just to meditate by her. So it's she. Here's her face. You can actually see some of the red and yellow paint that was her original paint. Originally was yellow, then painted red, and it's since been, of course, eroded. But I was fortunate just last a week and a half ago, it actually rained in Giza the whole day, which is unheard of. And I went to see her the next day. It was like she had a bath, like a shower. The colors were so vivid and bright, and unfortunately my camera didn't pick them up as well as I would like to. But you could really see the colors in her face now. And again, it's an African woman's face without a doubt. Next. Here's close-up, where I showed a close-up. I did this last year, 2003, and you go on a, a tour with Angela, which we're leading the tour next October. She's leading another one in, 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 in November, where you can actually go into the paws of the Sphinx now and get close to her, which I couldn't do until just 2003. It's a marvelous experience. So I took this, pyramid, this picture to show that the jaw has been damaged. Why has the jaw been damaged? Because the Egyptologists tell you that they had a name for her, Harim Achet, Horus in the Horizon. Well, it was an attempt to masculinize her. In the patriarchy, which I talk in great detail in my current book, How Patriarchy Arose, they put a false beard on her. And it's not there anymore, is it? She spit it out. She said, what the hell are you trying to do to me? It's in a corner in the Cairo Museum. I couldn't find it again. The Cairo Museum is a zoo. It's really hard to find things in the Cairo Museum. But it's in stuff in a little corner in the Cairo Museum, this little chintzy piece of limestone that is the beard. And you can obviously see it wasn't part of the original structure and not there today. Next. <clears throat> this shows the erosion. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail about this. This is John Anthony West, Robert Schock. Schock, a great geologist, 17-page resume. Andrea actually leads tours to Egypt with Robert Schock, one in March. Incredible man, I've met him, wonderful person. He's w convinced without a doubt that this is water erosion. Not only water erosion, but caused by rainfall. Rain beating down for thousands of years. Next, we'll go into more, closer detail of that. Thousands of years, water. This, he says, is a textbook example of water erosion. Not wind and sand, as Ahi Was and Mark Lehner will tell you. Could not have been done in the last 4,500 years. It, takes, it hasn't rained significantly in this area of the world. Like I said, it rained one day. That's probably it's all it's going to rain all year. Four inches of rain a year at Giza. Hasn't rained significantly in 8,000 to 10,000 years here. So it has to be the Sphinx is older than that. Because these blocks were all quarried out of here to build the temples, the structures in front of the Sphinx today, which we call, which are erroneously called, mistranslated as Valley Temple or, or Sphinx Temple. So that this area has to be older than 8,000 years. Next, we'll show you in more detail. As Robert Schock tells us, this is all stratified. Again, limestone is what's called a sedimentary rock. It forms in layers, sedimentary layers, underneath the ocean for millions of years. So one layer is put upon another. It contains the bodies of marine animals. This is called pneumolytic limestone. The animals are called pneumolites, little sea creatures. You can find them embedded in there today. And it, it lays deposits. So sometimes there's a soft layer, a hard layer, a softer layer, a harder layer. And what Schock has meticulously documented for us, it is the harder layers of this limestone that are more eroded, meaning only rainfall beating down at an angle for thousands of years could have caused this type of erosion. She has to be older than 10,000 years. And, and Schock is not alone. When he gave a presentation at the American Society of Ge Ge Geologists in San Diego in 1995, I think it was, he had 250 geologists lined up after his presentation to verify, to stand with him, not caring what Egyptologists said, to document that he's absolutely right about this erosion. Next. And this is what Mark Lehner likes to point to. Oh, no, this erosion was caused in prehistory because here we have a volcanic fissure that shows, or a seismic fissure that shows that this was an earthquake. This fissure has nothing to do with the erosion. It just shows the ignorance that these people try to portray as wisdom and intelligence. This fissure caused millions of years ago has nothing to do with this erosion. Nothing whatsoever. Next. The back of the Sphinx, clearly showing water erosion. Clearly, this is not wind and sand. Wind and sand does not do limestone like this. And uh, it's wonderful you can go and touch it these days. It's just a great experience. Next. 
And this is a very important piece. I want you to keep this in your mind. This is the, what Chris will go into much more detail about. This is the particular what we call rose quartz. I showed you other examples of it. Rose quartz granite, which comes from Aswan, where we take you, and I'm going to show you a slide of it, some 400 miles as the falcon flies from this area to Aswan. This is a, this, oh, I say this altar is 50,000 years old. That's just my opinion. This is the original structure. Again, Chris can talk about the type of, it's, it's clearly eroded. It's been attacked. It's been uh, subject to wind and sand since then. Uh, but original precision and tolerance is here. This is Chris's expertise. But I want you to look at this color. Keep the color. This is the natural color of rose quartz granite. Okay, let's move. The stele that's in front of the Sphinx tells the story of Moses IV. I'm not going to talk about it. It talks about him supposedly clearing the sand away from the Sphinx. She made him king. But what's shown here is underground structures under the Sphinx, showing that she's on her own platform. Looks like there's chambers, rooms, structures underneath the Sphinx. They don't talk about this. They just like to talk about the story that shows that he mentions Khafre's name or title here somewhere, showing that Khafre never mentions Khafre built the pyramid. It mentions just the title. I believe it mentioned that Khafre also cleared the sand away. And they don't want to talk about that because they're not going to talk about the Sphinx being buried in sand right after she was built or carved because that's impossible. Next. This is the alabaster floor in the Sphinx temple, one of the alabaster floors still extant. I date this floor at perhaps 50,000 years old. Still there today. And it's for sound resonance, for harmonics. Next. Here we are in the Great Pyramid. Let me see where we are. Okay. Um, Chris is going to talk about his theory here. What I'm going to do now is present a theory that he and I are both working on. And we call it the destruction hypothesis. Chris goes into detail about his book. The first one to really speak of this was the great British Egyptologist, the father of modern ar archaeology named Sir William Flinders Petrie. Petrie went into the Great Pyramid in the 1880s, particularly in the King's Chamber, and he said, there's something going on here. There's some strange anomalies. The walls of the King's Chamber seem to be separating from the floor. They're bulging out like some internal force acted upon him. There's also cracks in the granite beams in the King's Chamber, which I'll show you. Well, he mentioned something was going on. He couldn't understand why. Well, Christopher has followed up on this, and he and I are both working on this theory that there is distinct evidence that there was an explosion of fire in the Great Pyramid in antiquity, which, of course, totally negates it as a tomb right there, that because of the energy involved, something happened, and I'm going to show you evidence of that. I actually just had an article in a WEX issue about three issues ago, maybe two, three issues ago, where I had, actually it was last year, where it was, was there an explosion in the Great Pyramid? I had an article also in Atlantis Rising to this effect. So both Christopher and I are working on this idea. Now, Chris, this is in the Queen's Chamber. It's one of the so-called external passages which doesn't lead to the outside. Chris will go into detail about this. But they're staining here. Now, Chris postulates that hydrogen gas was produced in the Great Pyramid. We agree. He says, according to his evidence, and there is evidence to this, that chemicals may have been used a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid and an anhydrous zinc mixed together under proper conditions will produce tremendous amounts of hydrogen. And he also says he thinks this staining on this wall here could have been caused to the hydrochloric acid reacting with the limestone. Well, that's possible, but it's also possible that this conflagration we talk about could have caused this staining because, in my opinion, since we first discussed this theory in 1999 when we were in Egypt together, and I've gone back a couple of times, I have found damage to all walls inside the Great Pyramid. Every wall in every chamber shows damage and staining. Let's take a look. Now, here are these rectangular slots. We're in the Grand Gallery. There are, again, supposed to be 28 of these on each side, 14 on each side, 28 complete. Um, Egyptologists speculate statues of Khufu to build the Great Pyramid were put in these slots, although they've never produced any evidence of any statue except a three-inch little statue that's in the Cairo Museum, but that's another story. Never found any evidence. Well, there also isn't any evidence of what we think might have been there. Chris speculates in his book, he's a power plant. These might have been some kind of devices, resonators, to amplify the energy. He calls them perhaps Hemholtz resonators. Why they don't exist, we'll show you. But also, this is key, is right here. This is limestone, folks, but this is, looks like granite. It looks like that rose quartz granite. It's not. There's a patina on the walls inside the Grand Gallery, like they were subjected to great heat. Let's go on. Chris points this out. He's actually got a better, better slide in his PowerPoint than I do. There's these scorch marks in the ceiling of the Grand Gallery. They happen to correspond right over to these rectangular slots, right over. So we speculate during this accident explosion, these Hemholtz resonators may have exploded 
and cause these scorch marks. And again, let me stop you if you have any alternative ideas because I get emails all the time from our website, gizapyramid.com. Christopher and I are both the directors of research. Oh no, this could have been caused by torch marks from tourists or breath, carbon dioxide. Well, these things have been cleaned. Chris saw this when he went back in 2001. The Egyptian Department of Antiquities is always cleaning inside the Great Pyramid. And opposed to someone else who said they may use solvents, some harsh chemicals may have caused the scorching. Please, folks, this is Egypt. They use water. Soap and water at the most, but basically water. I've been inside when they do this cleaning. They don't use any harsh solvents or anything like that. They use good old-fashioned water. So they clean the ceiling, and they made these scorch marks even more visible. So these scorch marks go into the limestone. This is not an external reaction. This is something that reacted to the limestone itself, and we have even more proof. We'll show you the smoking gun. Next. And this is the smoking gun. And credit must be given where credit is deserved. Christopher Dunn needs to be given the credit for this because he made this discovery in 1999. We just did a conference. It's our second conference in 1999. We did our first conference where our good friend and great technical advisor who's working for us, Ted St. Rain, and I'm glad, honored to be working with him again, was doing the video and sound in, in, at that time. And we were in Egypt then together. Well, as they were videoing Chris at this time, and they shot the, fl they shot the floodlights, this is the upper wall of the Grand Gallery. Chris looked and said, now, wait a minute. Look what's there. This is not limestone. This is granite. This has never been said by an Egyptologist. This appears in no textbook. The wall, we know the Queen King's Chamber is all granite, but no one ever noticed before, because no one ever put a light on it, that the upper wall of the, of the Grand Gallery is all granite. But folks, I remember they told you to keep in mind the color of that rose quartz granite. This is rose quartz granite. It comes from Aswan. Look at this color. It's all scorched. It's all darkened. And folks, this scorching goes into the granite. Now, we've got a whole team of independent researchers involved. If we can get a micro slice, just a micro slice, of this wall, subject we've got geologists lined up, we've got chemists lined up, we've got electron scanning microscope at our disposal, we've got the lab work, we could test and see and let these independent scientists determine what type of heat, first of all, what type of discoloration it is, what could have caused it? What type of temperature could have been involved? We think this is the smoking gun, folks. This is definite evidence that this couldn't possibly have been a tomb for a king, that this was an energy device, and some event happened in it to cause an explosion, scorching, burning, charring of this rose quartz granite. Okay. Now we're inside the, the, king's, ch the king's chamber. This shows the cracks, as I saw them in 1992, that Christopher talks about in his book, which I talk about in my book. Cracks in the granite first seen by Petrie in the 1880s. What could have caused that? Well, Petrie, trying to come up with an idea, speculated it was an earthquake that might have damaged the structure. Well, the fact of the matter is you go inside the descending passageway, which goes 350 feet down. First 150 feet is constructed stone. Last 200 feet goes through limestone bedrock. And Petrie found it only deviates one quarter of an inch of the whole 350 feet. That should have been damaged. If it's an earthquake closer to the epicenter, the descending passageway should be offline, and it is not. So it was not an earthquake. Next slide. Went back in 2003, the crack is still there. The Egyptian Department of Antiquities has put these little snaps here, so it gives you folks as tourists when you go into the, the king's chamber and you say, oh, geez, oh, okay, it's not going to fall on us because they got these little safety clamps here. It's not going to fall anyway, folks. Don't worry about it. But Christopher will tell you his theory is the one I ascribe to. Whatever this explosion was, whatever this event was, because these, these are chambers above. He'll talk about them in more detail. Erroneously called mislabeled relieving chambers. They relieve nothing. They actually hollow so that these granite beams were thrust upward. They weigh about 70 tons, crashed down, and cracked. Had nothing to do with an earthquake. Some event happened in the king's chamber, which caused this. Next. Here we are at Abu Rush, the northern part of Bawizir. This is a pyramid. It's called the Unfinished Pyramid. It's destroyed. Nothing there. They claim it was the third son of this King Khufu. For some reason, he left Giza, went eight kilometers away, decided to build a pyramid here, but it's all destroyed, or it's quarried. Well, it's not quarried. First of all, here's the core blocks that show this was a pyramid. Next. And here it is again. I'm showing where the socket stones were. I actually found the corners of the pyramid. Next. This shows that granite was used there. It was built the same style. So the Egyptologists say this was inferior. That's why it collapsed. It was not inferior. It was built just the same technology as the Great Pyramid, part of the Buwizir Pernetters. Granite was used here, too. Next. And, okay, this is part of the explosion hypothesis. We, let me go one back. Can you reverse one? 
we use this to show that this, I say, evidence I'm gathering to support this explosion hypothesis is not just in the Great Pyramid, but through the whole grid line of what was Blue Wizard. And so this pyramid, I say, was destroyed, that it shook so violently during this event, which I document in my second book as occurring 11,500 years ago, a worldwide catastrophe, which is mentioned in two other books, Catastrophobia by Barbara Hank Clow and a book called Cataclysm 9500 BC, all put out by Barron Company by two British authors, Allen and Dallaire, that there is distinct evidence that there was a worldwide cataclysmic event 11,500 years ago. David talked about many of them. This is one that may be the most recent. I think it destroyed this pyramid. Next slide. We'll show you the other evidence. We go back to the so-called Bent Pyramid. Again, Egyptologists say, well, this was quarried. This was attacked by the Egyptian Arabs in the last couple of hundred years. The sides are easier to attack the corners than the main structure. So they pulled off not only the casing stones, but core masonry, and they used the blocks. Well, that's an interesting idea, maybe, but why is the stone still there? Most of the stone is still there. If they attacked this pyramid to use the stone, why did they leave the stone there? No. I say this is part of the explosion we talk about. The side, the corners being the weakest. When this pyramid shook violently, the sides blew off. Because they didn't attack the casing stones. If they're going to acquire this pyramid, the casing stones would be easier to remove than the core masonry, believe me. And they didn't. I speculate this is also a part of this cataclysm. Next. Here's the evidence of advanced machining. Christopher will talk more about this. He'll talk about the precision, tolerances, uh, we just took our group here. It's always great to use it. This, this piece of evidence is right out in front, right by the Sphinx. Everybody can see it. It's just right for Christopher and I. Next slide is Christopher took this picture of me in 1999. That's why I don't wear shorts anymore with these bony knees. But anyway, <laughs> here, this is incredible. It takes a man like Chris Dunn with 40 years' experience in materials manufacturing and high-speed technology to, to address this type of precision. You think this was done by copper chisels we have a bridge in Brooklyn we can talk about after we're done. Next. I have to move quickly because I've got to get to the other slide. This is that elephantine. We didn't take our people near Aswan. Another example of advanced machine that Chris will talk about. This was a shrine, one single piece of granite. Look at the work on it like it was, was turned on a lathe, like it's made out of clay and sculpted. This is granite, weighs 100 tons if it weighs an ounce. And the question is, what knocked it on its side? Not people trying to quarry it. 100 tons? Something happened to knock it on its side. Again, a cataclysmic event. Next. Here we are in the Cairo Museum. These are so-called sarcophagus made of alabaster. They are not sarcophagus. These boxes were used for acoustic harmonic resonance. Look at the polish on it. I'm actually discussing with a tour group in 1999 Chris's theories on advanced machining, how this could not be done by simple mechanical tools. The toolkits we see the dynastic people could not be done. Next. Here's the unfinished obelisk. Chris will talk more. We were just there. David and I, Chris, we had so much fun here. This is one, this looks like it's cracked, but originally it was one single piece of granite. Uh, David showed you Baalbek, which has, a, which has objects weighing 2,000 tons. They are more, but this is supposedly the longest object ever found. It's 120 feet long, estimated to weigh 1,200 tons. They, Egyptologists tell you, well, they couldn't complete it. It cracked. When they, when they were working on it, so they left it there. Well, David was the one, when we went there, when underneath found the crack on the underside. They didn't discover the crack. These cracks are all modern. They didn't discover the crack till the stone was dressed. And they were ready to undercut it, to finish it, to lift it, and put it into position. They didn't discover the crack until they got underneath, because the crack is on the underside. So they had every intention of finishing this piece and lifting it into position. And maybe that's the time to talk about that. How did they do that? Well, I'll just give you the indigenous tradition. Oh, we're coming to that. We're going to come to that. Next slide. There it is. In the Cairo Museum, I can take you all to see this, folks. It's right out there in the, in the open. It's mislabeled by British Egyptologist Walter Emery as being a, a ceremonial plate for lotuses. He had no other idea what it was. He found this cache in Saqqara in 1936 that had 10,000 objects made of stone. And uh, they don't have no idea what this was about. This is a schist plate, volcanic stone, very hard to carve. Looks like it's made out of clay, like it's actually made on a potter's wheel. It's almost razor thin, very thin, quarter of an inch, half an inch at most in radius. has these three lips on it, which you can't see too clearly, and a centered device. Hakim says this object was made to spin on a separate device, producing a sound frequency with the use of the human voice with a sound frequency, with running water to create an electromagnetic field, with crystals to amplify this electromagnetic field. They created a sound frequency which overcame the force of gravity, and that's how they cut 
lifted and shaped its stone by the use of sound, ultrasonics, and that's today it's being used. There actually is hydro, hydro it's used now. They usually use water jets coming at tremendous pressure now to, to shape stone. So we're saying anti-gravitics. David has some wonderful books that if you don't know the Wex catalog about anti-gravity, theories about anti-gravity. This is what comes from the indigenous people further in the Cairo Museum. Now these look like plates, okay, we could give Emery credit here, these could be some, but not this. Again, schist, this looks like it's part of a machine. It's part of another device that was meant to fit together and spin, rotate. That's the indigenous theory, folks. Anti-gravity is how the Great Pyramid was built. A thousand ton block, two hundred ton block weighs nothing if gravity's not involved. And we think it could have been a team of as little as 800 people could have built the Great Pyramid. <clears throat> Here is the tunnels. I talked about being in the tunnels underneath the Giza Plateau. There's a tunnel. It's called the Temple of Four Guardians. I can take you to it. You go down a space of around 30 feet. You come to where there's all sorts of stones, blocked limestone blocks that are blocking an entrance. I obviously put there by someone who, Supreme Council of Antiquities, they don't want you to see. I forced a hole. I put my camera through it, shot down. And here is under the limestone bedrock. Again, these type of tunnels. Now, it ends in a dead end here. Now, here's some other stones that have been placed here. Who placed them here? Supreme Council of Antiquities. Why? This, this tunnel makes a distinct left turn, and where does it go? To the Sphinx. All these tunnels were interconnected, water flowing, like the veins in our body, like the arterial system in our body. I go into much more detail in my book about this concept. Tunnels crisscrossing, water flowing, creating electromagnetic fields. Next. Here's a great glyph that's at Edfu, which was the per word, the teaching temple. House, per, T Pert Ascot, House of Water. What's the House of Water? There it is, Pernetter, Pyramid. Pyramid connected to water. The House of Water is the Pyramid. Clear. Here it is again, Pyramid, Pernetter, Ascot, Water, Water connected to the Pyramid. Clear. No argument to me, no debate. Next. And here's another symbol which I've given to a friend of ours who's on our, our group. Here's what's called, excuse me, the Waterman Glyph. Here's a man in adoration. This is N, actually the consonant N in the glyphs. It's also a symbol for water, another symbol for water, Ascot. This, is, this inscription was put there to say that this individual who they're talking about was considered wise because they knew the secrets of water. And here's another one, real interesting. mer e It means beloved in the ancient Commission language. It's where the name Mary comes from. Mary was not a name. It was a title. It actually applied to both men and women. Mary, the beloved. It shows how a lot of the names we have today, I discussed this more in the book, it's going to be out next year, came from titles. Mary is Mary. It's a title, not a name. Here's the Pur Wur. We found this in 1999, the fifth Pur at Edfu, the house of the wise men. That means Edfu was a particular temple that was a teaching temple. So this particular area of the temple was what became the first university where people would come to learn, the Pur Wur, the house of the wise men. Next. Here's in front of the Sphinx. This is an ancient dock where boats would come. It's quite obvious that boats docked here. The Egyptologists have no explanation to say that, well, the Nile would overflow and come here, but this is not the current Nile that we're talking about. It's the Nile that was over here. The Western Desert boats actually came around, came in front of the Sphinx to offer, to bring offerings to her as, a, as a, like a customs point, like a disembarkation point. Next. And this we're working on. This is not as clear as the Sphinx, but this is the west side of the Great Pyramid. Here are some of the original casing stones, still left. Now, this pyramid facing west is not subject to wind and sand, to the type of erosion that usually appears, because the wind in Egypt is known as the Khamsin. It comes out of the south, and I've been there when it happens, and it can just scorch your eyes. That's why you usually have these little Arab, Arabic, Arabic face masks that protect you from the sand and wind. You saw that in Lawrence of Arabia, whoever saw that movie. But this doesn't face the sand, the wind and sand. This faces the west. So the only type of erosion I speculate that this could be, could be water. And if this is water erosion, again proves the pyramid is older than 10,000 years. This is not as strong as we have at the Sphinx. I want to see Robert Schock and other geologists comment on this, whether they think this could possibly be water erosion, not sand. So that's something we're working on. Next. This is the... This is the east face of the Great Pyramid, which clearly shows wind and sand. This is subjected to the common sense. So once the casing stones have been removed, which is probably within the last couple of thousand years the casing stones have been removed, this area has been subjected to severe wind and sand erosion. It shows typical type of erosion caused by that. Next. 
here's the so-called mystery glyphs. David told you that we come across things that no one can understand. Now, I, I submit this to you for all you extraterrestrial buffs who want to get into this. Egyptologists cannot even comment on what this possibly could mean. It's not typical glyphs. This is the sign of the netter. Again, divine principle. Also, there's usually a star. Here it is. Star sometimes means from the stars or possibly extraterrestrial. And there's symbol like dots here, lines, a circle. Somebody speculated this could be, a, looks like a socket where something is plugged in. Hakim says this means the power of the netter. It just does respond to something. At one time, this was an actual device, a raised device with something metallic was plugged into to work with energy. So he agrees with that. At the Star Knowledge Conference, where I was just at, some of the extraterrestrials, including a gentleman who's going to be leading the tour with me next year, named Benny LeBeau, a Shoshone wisdom keeper, said he thinks this is a notation. This represents an, a, either a coordinate of something extraterrestrial. We had somebody channeling. Now, again, you folks can have your own opinions about what's channeled. Everybody, I always say you take channeled information with large grains of salt. If it resonates with you, fine. If it doesn't, forget about it because it can't be proven one way or another. But somebody who's a well-known channel channeled in that this is language of the ETs. You can take that for what you will. We see these glyphs all over Egypt. I have other pictures of it from different sites. This is at Philae, and it's right out in the open. I can show it to you. Next. Here she is. I told you we're going to show another so-called lioness face, Sekhmet, whose name actually means the power. She, uh, the Egyptologists like to call her the goddess of war and destruction. It shows in their patriarchal limited mentality, they think. She represents power, the power of woman. She represents the power of motherhood, unconditional love, tough love. If you understand how a lioness will do, she'll let her little cub chew on her ear just as long as she can tolerate it, then whap! And that's the lesson. Don't do that again. That's what she represents, tough love. But I bring this to you for another reason. We're just there two weeks ago, and I noticed something that she was cracked right along here. You don't see the crack here, 1999. This statue has been attacked. When I told this to Hakim, he was appalled. And he blames, of course, the so-called antiquities police, who have paid big money to protect these things. But if you go into the chamber that's before her chamber, her consort of Ptah is supposed to be there, but his head is missing. Obviously, you know what Muslims do, Arabs do, Egyptians do, they don't value this ancient civilization like we do. They know we value it, so when they find an artifact, they'll break it up into pieces and sell it to, to tourists. So we think she's been attacked. And they've been trying to remove her head to sell it. The reason why I bring this up is she told me in 1999, and yes, these things do speak to me, Sphinx speaks to me, you can take that for what you will. She told me to take a picture because she said to me as we were walking into the temple, I will not always be here in this form. The statue, the energy will always be there. We think this is an interdimensional portal, by the way, folks that are into that, that this is actually an interdimensional gateway where the statue is positioned. Once again, Hakim teaches us these things are always there for meanings, always there for a purpose, why they're at a particular place. A lot of people have great visions, great experiences with Sekhmet. Andrea, who's a great ceremonialist, does a wonderful ceremony here. She's very deeply connected to Sekhmet herself. So is my Teresa, so is Christine who's here in the audience, those other people who've been to Egypt, feel a very deep connection to Sekhmet. This, she has a relation to Sirius, the star system Sirius, so does the Sphinx. And there is, some people think, an extra-dimensional portal gateway right behind where the statue is, which actually can, you can project your consciousness to Sirius. You take this stuff as you will, folks. I just put it out there, you resonate with it, you don't. It doesn't make a difference to me, because this is the teachings I'm given and what I've experienced. But the important thing, go back, go back, go back. The important thing is, is that she's been attacked. So what she told me is true, that they're trying to damage. Andrea said to me, no, no, I've always seen that crack. Well, I said to her, well, how long have you been going to Egypt? Since 1999. Hakim said this statue was pristine. Not only that, she's got an iron bar behind her now, which is bracing the statue up against the wall. That iron bar wasn't there in 1999 when I was there. So this is just an example of what we have to deal with why we have to take pictures, why we have to get images, because this is why I had to go back to see the Temple of Maya, because I, I feel if Zahi Was finds out about it, it's not going to be there anymore for people to see. So it's still there. But that's why we have to take pictures and images to record these things. Otherwise, we have no proof, just lip service of what we've seen. Next. Now we're going into the second book. This gentleman is the reason why I got into Egyptology in the first place. Now, again, these were not names, these were titles. He was, he was given a title at birth, Amenhotep. Amen, darkness, the hidden. Hotep, I showed you, 
sac sacrifice, altar. It's a sacrifice to the dark one, to the hidden. Well, this gentleman decided that that title didn't fit him at all, didn't fit what he was all about. He's not in the age of Amun. So he took the title Achen Aten, or as the Egyptians like to say, Achen Aton. Achen Aten. Ach means the shade or the shadow. Aten, we showed you, the fourth stage of consciousness, the wiser, the state of enlightenment. The shade or the shadow of the wiser. Also, I say, literally means a reflection of enlightenment. Now you may say, well, isn't that arrogant of this individual to take this title, that Am, a reflection of enlightenment? Well, you know, it, it, Buddha, who was born Siddhartha of the Sakyamuni tribe, is given the title Gotam Buddha. Well, that means the awakened one. It's the same title, Akhenaten, Shadow of the Wiser. So this gentleman wanted to do away with the fact that we're in the age of darkness and wanted to return to the age of enlightenment, the age of Aten. And so he took this title, he stopped a lot of the practices of images of mummification. David and I have got into detailed ex discussions about this. There was no mummification during it. He only ruled for a time period of maybe 17 to 20 years. Ahmed Osman says 21 years. There's some evidence to that. Of a time period around 1350 B.C. This was, and I use in the book I'm writing now, the symbol of yin-yang, if you folks know that. You see the circle with darkness with a speck of light. You see the circle with light with a speck of darkness. So I say that even in the age of darkness, which we've been in for 5,000 years, there's those specks of light. Now you may call those specks of light Jesus Christ, Moses, Muhammad, Guru Nanak, the Buddha, uh, Yogananda, whoever. Uh, uh, Satya Sai Baba, there are these beings who've come along for the last 5,000 years who've been saying, wait a minute, it's not the way you guys have been taught by these religious leaders. There's, there's something else going on here. We all are enlightened. We're born that way. Well, he was one of those sparks of light. He was trying to return to a time where we didn't need religion. So he actually told the Amman priest, you're out of a job. We're not, we're, we're not worshiping darkness anymore. We're not selling indulgences. We're not selling mummification. We're not giving the bids to the highest bidder who could have the most prayers on their tombs, which is what dynastic religion was all about. He said we're going to return to a time where people can just meditate in the light of the sun. And opposed to what other people teach you about this man, he was not worshiping the sun. He was worshiping light, the power behind the sun. Light itself, which is not even... With, with light, which, which dispels darkness, which is illumination, which is what enlightenment means. This is the, uh, we have so many different statues of him. This is the most accurate of what he actually looked like. And this is probably, David, going to be the cover of the book. Because this is a statue that was done by the person who did the famous bust of Nefertiti. He had the name Tutmos, title, that is actually what he really looked like. Not as grotesque and cartoonish as we see the statues of him all over. And you can look at any book in Egyptology. Why? Because he told his sculptors, don't portray me as Superman like all these other kings are shown, muscular, young, always 20 years old. But I don't care about the physical. The physical is not important. Portray me as I am. I have some anomalies. He may have been seven feet tall. He may have had some endocrine disorders. So he said, portray me as I am. And they did. They did it overboard. They made him look cartoonish, except for this sculptor who did the most realistic portrait of him. And then there's those heads that David showed you about, the strange heads that supposedly his daughter's had with Nefertiti that could be extraterrestrial. There are people, there's actually a gentleman named Daniel Blair Stewart who's written a book called Akhenaten, the Extraterrestrial King, who actually claims that this gentleman was an incarnation from Sirius, had never been in human body before, and that's why the heads are so deformed. You take that as you will. Again, that's just things that are put out there. One thing is for certain, that he was an unusual human being. His teachings, although they made no impact, it seems, in Egypt, because after he leaves the scene, they go right back to the worship of Amun. They go right back to the way where they were before. But however, there may have been a person involved with him who brought these teachings out of Egypt, and it became the religion of Judaism. And this is a major section of the book I'm writing now, that this gentleman was part Hebrew and Egyptian. Hebrews come from ancient Egypt, not from Asia, that they were part of the ancient 42 tribes of Kemet. The original Hebrews were African people, not Asiatic. He was both Hebrew and Egyptian and Semitic, on the bloodlines I trace in the book, and, they, and after him was the Exodus. We date when the Exodus happened, and I give you historical documentation who Moses may have actually been. And let's go on, because we're going to show that. 
This gentleman is very important because he was one of Akhenaten's teachers, one of his major teachers. This statue is in the Cairo Museum, I can show you. And again, I'm striking a blow for diffusionism. Because not only did we show you the possibility that a Mayan may have been living in Egypt 3,300 years ago, look at this man's face. This is showing him as an, an old age. And this is part of the scribes. What people are saying, what is this thing sticking out? It's part of the, thank you, Ted. This is part of the scribes devices that he was with scribe. But it's particularly, you're not going to be able to hold it, so let it go. Okay. <laughs> but it's particularly the pose. The seating pose, Hakim says, distinctly Asiatic. Now, we're talking about mass diffusionism at this point, where people were coming from Asia to Africa, people from Africa were going to Asia. We say people were coming from Europe, maybe the Americas, Amaya, were all coming into this dynastic chemical period, infusing. This gentleman's face is clearly Asiatic, and I say possibly Tibetan. Is this possible in evidence that a pre-Tibetan individual was living in Africa 3,300 years ago? It's quite distinct. What is certain about this gentleman, he also had the title Amenhotep, I was like, wait a minute, offering to the darkness? But they also gave him the title Son of Hapi, or Child of Hapi. Hapi was the netter of the Nile. Hapi is often depicted as a male face with female breasts, because the Nile, the water is hermaphroditic, containing both masculine and feminine energies, the harmony of both. So by giving him the title Child of the Nile, they were saying that this man was an enlightened master, a great teacher. You know, so, Stephen, that is called the Kuzuo posture, where you're kneeling with your hands down. They had it at Tiwanaku in East Island. Great. Great. Yeah, that's a very curious, yeah. And Hakim says distinctly Asiatic. That's not the way people in Africa sit. Oh, okay. So it's. A lot of, like, Mexi 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 Great, David. Thanks. Got about five okay, go. Okay, more of this lineage. This is that gentleman, Akhenaten's maternal grandfather, known as Yuya. His tomb was found in 1907. A great book, which I don't know if you carry Osman's first book, Stranger in the Valley of the Kings. But it's a great book to read. It's, I, I recommend Osman's work, Ahmed Osman, very strong. David has his other books. Uh, he wrote a book, A Stranger in the Valley of the Kings. Why? This individual was the only individual of non-royal lineage who's buried with the kings in the Valley of the Kings. Why? He actually, his daughter, Akhenaten's mother, married Akhenaten's father and became king. So he was known as the father-in-law of the king. Well, why he's important is I'm telling you, and I agree with Osman completely, that this gentleman was the biblical patriarch Joseph. Here we get the patriarchs coming into Egyptian history, which Ralph Ellis, who David carries his books, talks about a lot. This gentleman with a very distinctly Semitic nose, was not commissioned, was from Asia probably, and I, we, they, we put Mitanni as actually being northern Syria. Just a little difference there. But this is where he came from. He was definitely Semitic. So here we have a linkage, which I'm going to talk about in my book in detail, Semitic traditions coming into Kemet, merging with Akhenaten's traditions, which is what became Judaism. So this man, I say, is an early Semite, whose father, maternal grandfather of Akhenaten, who brought in the Semitic teachings. His name, Yuya, actually relates to Yusef, Joseph. Next. I'm just giving you a tease here so you read the second book. Here is Moses, though, folks. Hakim took me to Akhetaten, Amarna, today it's called, in 1998. We went into a particular tomb, which he said was important for me, of the vizier of Akhenaten. Vizier meaning the man that was like prime minister, who was like in charge. But he said this particular gentleman who had the title Ramos, again, Ramos, it's a title. Ramisu, actually, in the ancient language, means a re misu means in reincarnation. A reincarnation of the second stage of the sun. Again, it was just a title. This is his tomb. Ha Hakim said this gentleman was important because he was a fan bearer of the king. Well, I'll say, did he just worship the king and wait to fail? No, he said, no. It also meant he had the ear of the king, which means he was a very close confidant, where he was totally part of Akhenaten's system of teachings. I say, folks, the, the Greeks would have called him Ramoses, and that's where Moses comes from. No matter what, Egyptologists go through all these gymnastics to try to come up where the name Moses comes from. They are taught in Judaism that Moses meant Moshe, which meant to draw out of the water, that the daughter of the king found this little baby in a reed basket and pulled him out. But why would an Egyptian woman be speaking Hebrew, a language that didn't exist for thousands of years until later? So Moshe, which means to draw out in Hebrew, has nothing to do with Moses. Moses is Misu, which means rebirth. And here he is, Ramos the vizier of Akhenaten, I'm speculating in his current book, this is Moses, a historical figure, which up until now has only been a myth. And it is my bias that every myth has a basis in historical fact of a person and event. Next. Here he is again. Okay, here's very important. You don't see this clearly, 
But here, Hakim pointed this out very clearly, are the 12 tribes of Hebrews in Ram Moses' tomb to show that they, before there were 12 tribes of Israelites, before, and in my book, I make a distinct difference between the words Hebrew, Israelite, and Jew. They are not the same people. Even though every Jew today practices Judaism, they are not the same people. And you'll have to read the book to find out why. But here, clearly, Hakim tells us the 12 original tribes of Hebrews were part of the 42 tribes of Temet. And here they are depicted on the wall in Ramos tomb. Next. And this is Akhenaten's great-great-grandfather, known as Moses III, title. Uh, he's very important because I have a major chapter in Rosicrucianism. Any of you who is interested in the true history of the Rosicrucian order, we deal with it in my book. It goes back to ancient Egypt. This man, by the Rosicrucians themselves today, is considered the traditional founder of the Rosicrucian order, going back to 1450 B.C. Next. This is the man who was the modern imperator of the Rosicrucian order, Dr. Harvey Spencer Lewis, who uh, founded the order in 1915 in New York City. I write in detail about him. He fulfilled a prophecy that was told to him in 1999 when he was initiated in France, where he said it would be the reincarnated soul of Amenhotep IV, Akhenaten, who had reestablished the Rosicrucian order in the land where the eagle spreads its wings. The symbol of the eagle spread its wings is North and South America. He was given jurisdiction for the Rosicrucian order in North and South America. He then accepted the fact he never paraded around and said that he might be a reincarnation of Akhenaten. He never made a big deal about it. He just accepted that he fulfilled the prophecy. And he, again, he never went on radio and television and said, I'm Akhenaten, folks. He never made a big deal about that. Next. And I'm done. Great. <laughs> And actually, there actually were there. There was um, another slide I wanted to show, but I brought it to show you. Uh, one thing in passing, we wanted to go to the Ramesseum on this tour we were just at. The Ramesseum's at Medinet Habu. It's near Luxor. It uh, supposedly was built in the 19th dynasty by Ramses II, dedicated to him. It actually is not, and it's a classic. And I have the picture to show you. It shows um, the, the Exodus on the walls. So there's always been a controversy that there's no documentation of the Exodus outside of the Old Testament. Wrong. We can show you the Exodus on the walls of Egyptian temples to show that it occurred in the time period we're saying. Okay, a couple of quick questions because we're not going to interfere with Chris. Yes? Uh, there's what's called the Collapsed Pyramid. But we don't consider it as part of a wizard because it was not a pernetter. So it's not an energy device. Again, they eventually started building these mastabas. Mastabas is just a stone bench. They started building them higher and higher until they resembled shapes of the pyramids that were already in existence, but they were glorified per cause, tombs. However, there's never evidence that anyone was ever buried in even these. So we think there were symbolic tombs, that they were never actually buried there. It's the so-called class bird. I've been inside of it. We did sound experiments and it was flat. There was no resonance, no acoustics at all, like there is. Chris will talk about the harmonics of the Great Pyramid. Anybody else? You're so blown away, you have no questions. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Um,